Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, yes, we are a webinar. Uh, you can call us that if you want to. We won't be offended. We try to embrace our webinars here, um, where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. The show is free and open to anyone to watch. Um, both the show and the recordings, after the fact, are always posted onto our website. So if you are unable to join us live on our Wednesday mornings, you can always go to our website and see all of our recordings. Um, we do the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, so that is when you can join us live. Uh, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, mini training sessions, um, book reviews, interviews, basically anything related to libraries, we are happy to have it on the show. Um, this morning, we have a guest speaker with us. Um, on the line with us is uh, Rochelle McPhillips from the Columbus Public Library here in Columbus, Nebraska. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and she's actually on, now you're part of the Young Adult Roundtable, which is, um, the Young Adult Roundtable is on the roundtable as part of the Nebraska Library Association. Now, are you the chair this year? I'm not sure. Yes, yes you are. I'm the chair. Yeah. The okay. Chair. And uh, she contacted us uh, last year sometime saying our, our Young Adult Roundtable wanted to have some ongoing, some sessions here on Encompass Live. We thought that was great, getting a lot more information out there for people serving um, the teens and, as you see here on our slides, the tweens. Uh, so um, I'll just hand over to you and you can go ahead and take it away and maybe, I don't know if you want to do more of an introduction of yourself um, and um, go ahead and uh, continue on with All your right. presentation. Start. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, this morning, I just want to start by saying, um, we'll just start with the definition of passive programming for teens and tweens. When I say passive programming, what I mean is a program that has uh, some sort of interaction or outcome that does not require your direct facilitation. If you weren't sure what passive programs were before and you had done an internet search, you may have seen um, some results that were bulletin boards or displays. And for me, this goes one step further. This is something they can do or uh, create. Passive programs at Columbus Public Library came about because I was building a young adult summer reading program from the bottom up. And I wanted to provide three programs a week. But with my other responsibilities, I wasn't able to facilitate three. So anytime activities, as they're called for patrons here, were born at CPL. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why. I'm going to try to convince you to do some programs in your libraries. And then I'll take a, I'll take a breath and uh, answer any questions you might have after this first section. Oh, there we go. It advances. All right. One of the great things about passive programs is that they happen without you being there. Um, having three programs a week, while this one's running, I can be at my desk reading or purchasing books. I might be able to take a 15-minute break once during the summer. Um, so that think about these. Um, if you are in a library of one or two staff people, if you're not providing team services during the summer, Maybe a passive program is something you can do since no one has to facilitate it. Uh, we engage patrons that we don't otherwise engage in programs with our passive programs. Uh, I have some kids that come in and they check out stacks and stacks of books, but they don't ever come to my programs, even the book clubs. But sometimes they'll stop and take a look at the Anytime activity and they might participate as well. I have some teens that hang out in the teen space pretty much dawn to dusk in the summertime. And our anytime activities are a great way for me to, uh, if I need to make a phone call or finish a thought <laughs> or get something off my to-do list, I can say to those teens, have you done the anytime activity yet? Or is that table a mess over there? Would you mind cleaning it up? Uh, this off offers an opportunity for our young adult patrons to connect to other staff people besides me in the library. Uh, for our programs that they have to sign in for or they have to check something out at a desk, since I'm not always here, we send them to a point of uh, service that's always staffed. And that gives them a chance to meet someone new. 
it also puts some of our intentional users, the kids who come here on purpose for library, uh, traditional library services, it puts them in front of staff people who don't always get to have that interaction with young adults. Um, they might have to maintain an atmosphere after school and correct behavior. And so this gives them a, a different view of the teen user. These programs also foster collaboration, both directly and indirectly. Uh, directly, kids sitting side by side at the crafting table creating or working on the project together. And then indirectly, for our programs that build on, it, it builds on itself throughout a week or over a month. And they can come in and see what someone did yesterday. And that might inspire them to create something different today. And these last two points are really important, and I like to stop here and tell a story about last summer. I had two patrons signed up for my program who have special needs. And one of my programs, I was a little nervous if they'd be able to do these on their own or not. And it just so happened, they came in on totally different days, and um, someone else was doing the program when they came in. And both times, the person doing the activity offered to help the other team complete the, the task. And one of those I saw happen, but the other one, another staff person witnessed. And she was so moved by it that she made a point to come up and tell me about it. And then she told other staff members about it. And we've worked hard here to alleviate tension between um, our patrons and young adult patrons and our staff and young adult patrons. And this was an opportunity to just reinforce that positive feeling. Our passive programs are easy to recycle and reuse. Uh, I've had some hands-on programs that at one went 45 minutes, and I had planned two hours, and we were done so early. So I just told the, one of the teams, go grab everything off the table in the team space and bring it in here. We'll do that activity together. And that helped fill up our time. Another time, I was doing a program that I thought would be a blast, but they were looking at me in horror. So I said, guys, is this dumb? And they said, yes. And I said, is this embarrassing? And they said, yes. And I asked them if they wanted to stop, and they did. So we grabbed the anytime activity from the team space and uh, pulled that in, and that helped fill our, our activity that day. Uh, a lot of these, too, I've used. Um, to fit one summer uh, reading program theme, and then I've revamped it two years later to fit another theme. And I'll uh, talk about specific examples later. These are really inexpensive projects I'm about to show you. Some of them are really just my time and some printing costs, in-house printing costs, so very inexpensive. And then just like we should keep our websites fresh and updated and we want to be creating content for our social media sites so that patrons will keep coming back and, and checking us out and seeing what's new. We can do that with passive programs in our libraries. Every week there's a new thing for the teens to look at. And sometimes every day there's something new to look at if it's a program that's growing over time. Some things to consider when you're planning your programs are statistics. Do you need to keep stats for every program that you run? Um, and if you do, how are you going to measure your participation? For me, I do, have, I do have an element in most of my programs where I can count the number that have participated. But for some of them, because of the way our library is situated, if they have to come upstairs to see what the activity is, and then go downstairs to check something out, and then come back upstairs to do it, and then return that kit, they might not participate. And I would prefer that they have an opportunity to create and have that experience rather than track that statistic. So I'll, either, I'll mark that as something that I um, either did not track, um, or I'll try to take a best guess at how many participated based on how many projects were completed or how many I saw as I was walking through the team space that week. And then safety is an, an issue in some libraries. Uh, is it OK if you leave scissors out on a table in your team space? Or if you don't have a team space, if you're going to put your table um, just wherever you have room for it, is that 
area used by small children a lot. Is that safe to leave those scissors out? So think about that. Also, think about what you're willing to part with. Um, things do walk away. Markers disappear. Uh, sometimes glue sticks uh, get smashed and just thrown into the garbage. Um, that does happen. And if you are, if you're okay with them using all of the glitter foam stickers on day one, and maybe one patron using all of those themselves, then put them all out at once. If that will make you angry or <laughs> frustrate you, then put a few out every day or just keep the cute glitter stickers for yourself. And then think about staff time and involvement. When a patron goes to, it's our reference desk here that they check things out. If they go to that desk, I don't want that interaction to cost staff more time than any other customer service interaction. So, you know, it has to be about the same amount of time as where are your cookbooks, do you have this book, uh, that sort of thing. If it's to the point where if we were helping someone with an e-reader and we would offer them an appointment, I want staff to do the same for the anytime activities. And I just tell them, take the patron's name and number, and I'll get back with them, and I'll do the activity with them on their own. And some things that um, you should consider. The programs that have been the most successful for me are the ones that I have spent the most time planning and preparing. I have, and I admit this with shame, put <laughs> programs on my calendar that I didn't quite know what I was going to do. I thought, oh, I'll figure it out by mid-July. And then June goes by in a blur, and I haven't figured it out yet. And those programs tank, and we don't talk about them specifically anymore. Uh, but the ones that I've put a lot of thought into have been some of the most fun and uh, can be repeated again and again. Uh, it's also a good idea to have someone else on your staff try this before you put it out for your patrons. Um, I'm I'm tall and I wear high-heeled sandals to work a lot in the summer. So when I did a treasure hunt that told patrons to take 17 steps north or 10 steps to the east, uh, I had another staff person who isn't as tall as I am and was wearing flats. I asked them to walk through it so we could adjust the number of steps if we needed to. I also, with the technology that I'll show you later, the, the QR code activities, I handed our iPad to another staff person who I thought was proficient enough uh, to replicate a teen experience and said, see how you do. Here's, here's what you need to get started and let them go. And when she was able to uh, have success with the program, I felt confident that I could leave it um, out for patrons. And then as we're looking at the specific programs here in just a couple of minutes, Think about how you can uh, rework these for either children or for adults or for all ages. Uh, maybe one of these is something you could use for National Library Week for uh, the whole family. And then finally, moon sand is, is probably a bad idea uh, for most libraries. Uh, our first teen space was um, my former office, and we had painted the walls orange, and hung cool posters of dolphins and palm trees. It was a very colorful room. Uh, but it was in a highly trafficked path to our computer lab, which is around the corner and out of sight. But as you know, mom and dad and, and junior were walking by, the little guy would see this cool room with these fancy colors. And, and see, and I had thought, because it was a beach theme, it would be fun to have a sandbox in there. So Junior made a beeline for the team space, and mom and dad went around the corner to the computers. And before we could reunite them, um, moon sand had been flung everywhere. And I spent a lot of time vacuuming that week. So the little guys had fun, that's true. But it didn't work the way I thought it would. Uh, our team space is now in a dedicated area that you, kind of, you have to come in on purpose, pretty much. Uh, so we could probably do that now. Uh, but I'm probably going to save that for a little while. 
So I'll take a breath and a sip of water and see if anyone has questions for me at this point. Sure. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. You can pop that open and type in there. Um, I'm monitoring the questions here, so please do. At any time when you come up with them, just go ahead and type them in, and I'll grab them when we do have our breaks there. Um, yeah, I saw that that moon sand is probably a bad idea, and I, I thought, oh, this is going to be a, a we learned from <laughs> experience. Yeah, <absolutely. laughs> Story. And I suppose you could still do it if you're willing to do the cleanup afterwards. <laughs> but I'm just not a big fan of how. tracking down the vacuum, so <laughs> mm -hmm. it's not my, not my yeah. way to spend my summer. Yeah. And how long is it going to take to clean up all of that? And how long, how many months will you still be finding it in corners <laughs> somewhere? Absolutely. Oh, and actually, someone does, did ask, they want to know can you define what moon sand is? Is that a particular kind of um, Yes, it's, it's um, something you can buy in the um, toy section, and mm -hmm. it's somewhere between like um, sand and play-doh. Really, you can mm -hmm. pack it in, and it makes shapes that hold for okay. quite a while until you smoosh them. Mm. Uh, yeah, it seems like it's, there's been like. Um, commercials or um, infomercials on TV that I've seen that kind of stuff where you can create stuff and it sticks it sticks together somehow. Yes, it does. And, it's not just and, loose sand, yeah. Right, and that summer there was one that had a beach theme. There was a mermaid and seashells and it mm. just, it lent itself to uh, the room and how we had decorated. So, and I just thought mm. it'd be fun. Yeah. It, it was, just not, mm -hmm. not for the patrons I thought it would be fun for. <laughs> Uh, we do have another question. Um, how would you know if a program was being used? Um, would, does a patron sign a list or something by the projects so that you know that um, how many times something that they've used on their own? Sure. Um, some of these are are a program where they have to sign in, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll talk about that specifically shortly. But they either sign in or they have to check something out. Or okay. they start completely autonomously and fill out an answer sheet and take it to the desk to get a prize. Uh, and okay. then I get to follow up yeah. answer sheets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now I'm not sure if you're going to get into this more, but someone does, um, what other types of passive programs are you doing? I'm not sure if you were going to expand more on that. They want they said, ours are mostly make and take crafts. Do you advertise that you were doing this on your website, etc.? I don't know if that's some things you were still going to be getting into. Yep, and these, these go on my calendar um, mm -hmm. in June and July as Anytime Activities. There's a different one every week, and I list what it is. Sometimes they don't know <laughs> what that means, but they come in and check. The right. teams are looking for these now. Right, once it's become a thing, they want to see what's the next one going to be and what can I do next week. Absolutely. Right. And what was, can you repeat that question? Um, well, the actual question was, what other, ty well, it's a mixture of questions, <laughs> a couple different ones, about the, do you advertise that you're doing this on your website, and then what other types of passive programs are you doing? Ours are mostly make and take crafts. Yeah, most of these are make and take, and then I'll show you the, the other ones here in a couple of minutes. Okay, cool. Well, that's all the questions right now that I've got. Um, go, why don't you go ahead and continue? And as I said, um, type in your questions whenever you come up with them um, as um, Rochelle's talking, and I'll um, pass them on when we um, have a chance to jump in. All right, excellent. Cool. Here we go. Thanks. Maybe. Let's see if I'm. There we go. I'm clicked on it now. All right. So now we're going to talk about some programs that work. And programs that work, um, the simple crafts like bookmarks. Um, I just cut bookmark shapes out of cardstock here, simple white cardstock, and then let them create and design their own. And actually, this is probably better if we flip over to my uh, Pinterest page, or rather the library's Pinterest. And this website address shows up again at the end of my presentation, uh, so if you can't see um, it'll show up again. But some of these, and I don't know, can you see my cursor? Uh, yes, we can. Yep, we can see everything you're clicking on and everything you're doing. Okay, excellent. Yep, yep. and also if anyone, would, um, as far as the any websites or URLs that are being shared, um, as part of Encompass Live, we always capture, I always grab all of those and put them into a, our delicious account, and after the show is over, when we send you out the recording info, there'll be a link where all of these are gathered together for you, too. So if you don't want to try and scribble down every single one of the uh, 
URLs during the show. Um, we'll send you a link with all of them afterwards. All right, great. Thank you. Well, this first one, you know, the bookmarks I thought was, was pretty simple, but um, like I said, I just cut shapes out of uh, cardstock and lay those out with ribbon, yarn, beads, uh, any kind of drawing utensils and a hole punch, and, and they have fun creating. They've spent lots of time creating lots of bookmarks. Um, and this uh, pin is just showing how they used some paint chips and simple markers. Or they might, I think these look like stamps, actually. These are probably stamps. And then paper lanterns. I'll go ahead and click through here. Hopefully this will load. Um, these are really simple, and they're actually something you could do in a, if you're in a small classroom promoting summer reading. Uh, they can make these while you're talking about summer reading. Uh, these we've used to decorate our teen space. I used them during uh, the summer that we had You Are Here as our theme. So we had Chinese paper lanterns. I revamped that uh, a couple of years later, I think during our night theme perhaps, uh, I used this during the 4th of July week. So I only put out red, white, and blue supplies, and I had some of the, that wire garland that had straws on it, or stars on it, uh, for them to use. And then the tissue paper flowers, uh, this I used again while we were doing the um, You Are Here theme or Mexican tissue paper flowers. And this, you can see how inexpensive this could be. This is, um, you can buy a package of tissue paper, cut it into thirds, and then I even cut these chenille stems. It's going to advertise to me. I cut these chenille stems in half, and that makes the, the program uh, less expensive. And then when I put these particular programs out, like the, um, lanterns or the tissue paper flowers, I'll actually make this step one or two and attach it to some poster board and label it. And then I'll make this step and attach it to the poster board. So they have a physical representation uh, when they're reading the instructions. Not just the picture, but they can see it uh, in person. And then this is how we decorated our teen space for last year's Beneath the Surface. You know, it had a gardening, you could use a gardening theme with that. So we made flowers and hung them in our teen space. The back page here. And then this one is interesting. Um, during the first, the first theme where it was, I think, make waves, it had to do with water. I found these amazing cups that this artist makes. And this flicker stream is remarkable. He makes incredible art on styrofoam cups. And like I said, inexpensive crafts here. Um, not expensive to buy a package of styrofoam cups. And then we use colored pencils and markers to create ours. And I put information about the artist and then a couple of examples of his work so that they could um, get inspired. Yeah, wow, those are really amazing. Really yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So if you need a brain break, you know, you need to congratulate yourself for getting through something that was difficult, then take a little break and check out Chi Ming Bowie's Flickr stream. Mm -hmm. Really amazing. And they, they really enjoyed that. They had a lot of fun with that. And then they got to display them in the library. And then also, when you get to come back to this board on your own, a couple of the activities we'll talk about later in the presentation, I uh, pinned some examples for you so you could see where I got my inspiration. Okay. And here's a passive program that you might already be doing with your teams. And I'm going to talk about this for a little bit so one of my other passive programs will make more sense to you. Uh, during the summer, uh, teens come in and they sign up for our summer reading program they get a reading log and instructions. Our summer reading requires that our teens and tweens, 6th through 12th grade, read for five hours every week. And then they come in and the ticket for reading those five hours, and then they put their ticket in a box that's labeled with 
a prize. And our prizes include things like gift certificates to uh, local stores, Columbus Bucks, which are chamber dollars. We have movie theater passes that are very popular. And then a book of your choice. I give two of those away. And I didn't know if those would be popular, but those are really popular. And the kids who win those are elated to have won a book of their choice. Uh, and then we have a big, we have some other things in addition to that, but um, our big prize, the draw for that has been an iPod Touch in the past. And I ask local banks to support our prizes for summer reading, and I ask them for $100, and the last two years, I think, yes, two years, I've had four and a half of them participate, so I've been able to purchase these prizes uh, with donated funds. Now, some of our rules for our summer reading came out of uh, talking to teens, or talking to middle schoolers, rather, about summer reading. When I went out to the schools to promote, uh, and then they'd ask questions about, well, how would you know if I really read that? Or, well, I'm going to just say that I read 10 or 15 hours. And, um, or I'll just come in at the end of the summer and get all my tickets at once. And uh, so I was very grateful that they uh, tipped their hand so I could uh, design a program that would work. And they have to come in this week to get this week's ticket. Uh, we don't give this week's ticket out next week. Um, and then that keeps them coming into the library, keeps us um, connecting with them throughout the summer. And uh, they, have a, they do have a lot of fun with this. Now, if you have a problem getting reading logs turned in, this is not a perfect system, because there are some teens that will read 10 or 20 hours a week, and we still only give one ticket uh, per week. So uh, at the end of the summer, I dump those prizes after I do my drawing. I just count the tickets that are in the boxes. Um, and that makes, I get a more accurate count than if seven kids turn in reading logs, but 30 participated. Now that you know how that works, we can talk about our read-in. Uh, two times during the summer, once in June and once in July, I'll have what we call a read-in. This is passive. They go to our reference desk or our point of service, so wherever that would be for your library, and they sign a sheet with their name and what time they started. And then they go sit down somewhere in the library and read for one hour. They come back to the desk and check out. They sign out that they're leaving. And the staff person gives them a ticket to put in the prize drawing. And they can come in twice during that week to read. And this is incredibly popular because this you get, you get two extra tickets that week. And you don't have to read five hours for each of them. So I had Wildlife Encounters come out for a program last week summer, and he does amazing work and brings some incredible animals. And last year, he brought us a kangaroo, and it was a remarkable program. Well, it was time to go down to see him, and I had two girls reading in the teen space, and I said, come on, guys, it's time to go. And they did not want to go, because they had been dropped off, and this was their only hour they were going to be able to do the read-in, and they were determined to get that ticket. And both of them won prizes that they wanted, so it paid off. Uh, I don't want them to miss out on cool programs, but it, I was tickled that they wanted to read instead. And then uh, if you do this one in conjunction, if, if you're going to do this similarly, I make these tickets a completely different color than the other tickets, so that when I'm counting reading hours, I know that these are worth one instead of five. And then Mini Box City, this is one that I pinned an example of. They, they use cereal boxes in that example. But what I do is I ask staff to save their small boxes, Band-Aid boxes or those little mini cereal boxes. Uh, we have somebody on staff who eats a lot of Hot Pockets, so we get a lot of boxes from that. Uh, and so they collect those for me. And then we can use recycled newspaper, which makes it incredibly inexpensive here. Or I've put out construction paper and... Um, just anything that they would need to create a building out of those little boxes. Uh, so tape, blue paper, markers. 
And I set up one, uh, one table where they, they put their houses together. So that table can be messy. And then I put up another table where they actually set up their houses and their buildings. So, and that grows over you know, a week or a month. I usually leave this out. We started in June and I leave it out until July. And this creates a lot of buzz around the library. Uh, teens will bring their parents in to see what they've created and what other kids have created. And staff members come up frequently to um, check on the progress of our city. So, and again, really inexpensive. Now, I had thought that it would look so cool if everyone had, you know, little boxes covered with newspaper and then they decorated them, you know, with bits of construction paper or markers. Uh, this did not look the way I had pictured and was a great lesson for me as a young librarian that the end result doesn't have to be my end result. That the creation and the creativity and imagination is what's important. And, and it, I'm glad I learned that lesson. This is what our first mini box city looked like that summer. Uh, you can see here in the front, there's one person who copied my example and bless their heart. Uh, they're one of my favorites. I don't know who they are, but I'm, I'm, it's precious that they uh, did that. And then over here we have a house that has, I think inside these windows were actual tissue paper curtains. And then they, you know, they made a little bush here in front of the house, so they had landscaped. Someone here made a dance studio, and inside, that is a chenille stem ballerina uh, dancing her little heart out. And then someone constructed this amazing tower here in the background. And I know that I had a conversation with the builder, and I just can't remember what they said that was. Um, later in the summer, we had some, what we would call new adults now in the library world, uh, hanging out in the evenings in our team space. And one night I went home and all was well with, with our city. And I came in the next morning and there were paper flames attached to the tower. And this was a moment where I had to decide, do I leave this? Because uh, I was pretty sure it wasn't one of our registered participants who had done that. Or should I let them figure it out? And I decided that, you know, because someone had thought to, to create emergency services, over here we have a hospital, that I could go ahead and, and let them decide what would happen in their city. Another program, and we did this last year, and this is one of those, I will admit, that I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with this program. And I put it way at the end. It was our very last week, the dead end of July. And uh, it did come together, and it came together very well. I spent about a half an hour walking around our downtown area, and I took pictures of local businesses, their front doors. And I uh, printed those in color, and I just I glued them to poster board. And then I created a list of clues. So it said, guess where? Behind these doors you will find, and then the first one said something like that drum set you always wanted, or enchiladas de puerco, um, and I, I matched the clues for the businesses, and then I left out an answer sheet so they would match the letter that was by the picture to the number by the clue. And then they took those downstairs to get a little prize, they loved this. And 11 patrons participating in a program um, at any time is a decent number for me. 11 patrons doing this program, a passive program, at the very end of July was phenomenal. Uh, and we were, um, my director actually asked me to save the poster. She said, I don't know what we do with it again, but I think it's cool, so please keep it. And this is one that I think we could re use for adults. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, when you have a, a program and there's time to mingle beforehand, patrons won't always visit with one another. So I think this would be especially good for um, a book club at the beginning, especially if you have a lot of new members. Uh, they can look at the poster and then visit about what door that would be. And for them, I wouldn't put any clues or um, any answer sheets. It would be more of an icebreaker, I suppose. Um, but it's a fun project. 
And then this one is one you can think about, how can you revamp this? And I used businesses in our town, you know, just their front doors. But you could also do this with doors from literature, like um, The Hobbit House, Bags End, or, <clears throat> excuse me, or the door to Narnia and have a picture of the wardrobe. Um, you could also, uh, I think, in other presentations I've shown the TARDIS or um, Shakespeare's birthplace or uh, Sherlock Holmes, his street. Um, you could also do this differently with, I think there are some characters that have iconic objects, you know, like hats. You could the cat in the hat, you could come up with things like that to use and they could guess or match to clues. And book in a jar. This one is one, an idea that I got from Pinterest. And I will warn you, a book, a novel is big when shredded. <laughs> and you will need a big jar. I know we had a big pickle jar and then we had a big, um, we had a couple different jars that we thought would be big enough and they were not. This jar, I actually asked a local bar owner if they had one of those um, jars that they keep those eggs in. And she said, well, I have one that size that had olives in it. And I said, that's fine. That'll work. Um, and this is um, Poor Harry Potter, the first book. Uh, it was a lot of fun to shred a book, I have to admit. Probably more fun than, than it should have been. Um, and that book is stuffed tight into that jar. And I did not purposely place any of the strips of paper so that you could identify what book it was or which book in the series it was. Um, and I put up a little sign next to it and a little box for the entry forms. And this is taped. It's got some duct tape on the top and some packing tape around it, so they weren't getting into this jar. And uh, some people guessed the series correctly, uh, but there was one word showing and someone on our staff knew that that only happened in the first book, that one word. And I just thought that was remarkable. And I did not plan that. Wow, yeah, that that's was a lot crazy. Of fun. <laughs> I think this is one that you could probably you know. put out as a display for National Library Week for the whole family. Uh, I don't know if I would shred a picture book and have them uh, guess that. I don't know if that's a a message we want to send the little guys, but um, this is one I think you could definitely use for adults. Or as a display at a, at a community event if you have a table there. So I have one more passive program to talk about, but before I get to it, I wanted to talk about our summer reading program theme specifically. Uh, some of these are, are what I'm using for sure this summer. Uh, registration usually counts as my first anytime activity. Um, and then Mini Box City will be our first official activity. Um, and that will actually be left out for the month of June. But during those other weeks of June, I will have another activity for them to do besides Mini Box City. Um, I'll do a read-in both months. And then I'll do a QR code activity or two. And then from your summer reading program manual, if you have one of those, the young adult section has on page 37 instructions for catapults. And if you hot glue the caps onto the tongue depressors ahead of time, I think this is one that you could definitely make passive. And I would probably, I'll probably leave out some, you know, Dixie cups and I have a couple of pom-poms that look like Angry Birds and the Pig. Uh, so I'll probably leave those out for them to um, play with. There's instructions for making rain sticks on page 68. And I think it's possible to rework this for an anytime activity. Um, I haven't quite figured out how I will, but I think it's possible. Uh, the pan pipe with straws on page 69 is one that, that we can do. Uh, another librarian told me they tried this one already, and it worked. It took a little, um, a little time to line the straws up just perfectly, but I think, I think that our teams would be able to do this on their own. And then there are instructions for flame line art, which I thought could turn into a passive community art project if I covered a wall with paper and let them create you know, flame line art. So take a look at that one, too. I think that will be some, um, that could be fun to see where they go with that. 
All right, and this is our biggie. This one's kind of difficult to explain. So um, I had heard for a long time that we should use QR codes. There are QR codes, use them. And I didn't know how, so I filed that back in the back of my brain. And then on the YALSA listserv, and if you want to sign up for that one, it's the YAAC YALSA listserv. Um, they talked about doing live choose your own adventure, where they would print part of a story and then offer two decisions you could pick from. And then one of those decisions would, you know, those decisions would lead you to a new place in the library where you'd continue the story and continue making decisions. Well, I thought that was fantastic, and I thought I can totally do that. But then I thought, oh, it would be cool if I married those two. So I wrote the story out and created QR codes for them. And I used this website called qrstuff.com. And we don't have enough time to go into this in super detail, but we can talk about it for a second. Um, and you can come back to this, of course, in the archive. Uh, but basically, what you do is you go to this this website, qrstuff.com, and then you plug in a website if that's where you want your code to point to. Or you can come down here along the side and choose plain text, and then type in, it'll give you a box to type into, and then it'll generate a code on this side of the screen for you that you can download. So I, on the Yalsa listserv, someone had shared a story that you could use. And I used that story and then just changed the locations, where they would go to um, if they decided to take this action or that action. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. And because there was so much reading in this activity, this was worth one ticket for our raffle. Okay. And then I also did a scavenger hunt. Uh, the scavenger hunt was inspired by the Daring Librarian. And it's a website, as she keeps a blog, and she has a wiki space that I linked to on our Pinterest page. And um, she does amazing work and does some great art and creates cartoons for her entire staff. And she is not me. <laughs> I do not have that skill set. So I made it work for me and for our librarian patrons. Excuse me. I'm going to go down. This is what our scavenger hunt looked like. Um, using our iPad mini that we have here uh, to use for library staff, and we used it for patrons for this event. Um, and the app that we had installed, and I'll show you that in a minute, they would scan this code. And this code tells them to write their name in this box. And then the next line is a clue where to find the next code. And last summer we had a, a bulletin board that said getting to know or get to know your staff. So the clue is this QR code is getting to know your staff. And they went to the board and they found the code and they scanned it. And then they had to write my there was a question when they scanned it, a question popped up on the iPad and said, Who's Rochelle's favorite author? And then they had to write that um, over there in the box on the right. And then this last QR code. Uh, was a survey. How would you like to receive library updates? Twitter, Facebook, other. And this is one that you know I can pull back out and we can use this again. I'd have to change this one where getting to know your staff and then if we've moved anything around I'd have to change those of course. But definitely one I can rework and reuse. And I think we could use this one for adults or we could use it for families and uh, whole families could do this throughout the library, or you could expand it, and I think you could do this across town if you wanted to. And I wanted to point one thing out, because if you've talked about QR codes before, and if you've talked about this site specifically, you may have heard to click this little radio button that says, use our URL shortener. And if you use that, it makes a nice uh, tidy little code, like this over here, you can see how much white space there is on this code. And you can see here on this code how staticky it looks. Um, why I did not use that shortener is because it takes them out of the app. So I didn't want them to have to find the app again, over and over again. So that's why I left them staticky.
And the, the QR reader apps that I used for this, um, because I was using an iPad mini, I used the Enigma reader. And it's a simple to use app. It's free. So if patrons wanted to use their own device, they could install this themselves. And the one that I thought worked similarly to the Enigma reader was QR Droid. It's not the first one that comes up in your Play Store, um, but it's the one that I thought worked uh, the most like the Apple product. All right, so thank you. And we did mention YART at the beginning. Oh, I animated this, so I have to click. There we go. Um, I, we mentioned at the beginning that I am the chair for YART this year, and um, I want to encourage people to um, get involved with YART. Um, and if you're not involved, tell us why aren't you involved? What would you like to see from YART? Uh, what would you hope to get out of your membership? When you um, pay for your NLA membership, YART is just another $5. And we have um, meetings and, and we try to send out information that's usable for people programming and collecting for uh, teams. And I want to show you our Facebook page. Uh, I try to post to this at least once a week. And uh, there's links to articles that I find useful or interesting. Uh, I also have linked here, uh, if you watch Encompass Live next week, uh, right after that there is a Google Hangout with three authors who are going to be discussing um, sexual violence in the lives of teens and young adult literature. Apparently, Doctor Who has been kissing on girls without permission. Um, and they're going to talk about it next week. And then I also do a little bit of um, fangirling over my own book, over my own favorite books, but I'm totally open to you doing the same with your favorite young adult literature. And then here I've, I've linked to a resource that I use to help me with collection development called yalit.com, very simple website keeps me in the know. You can see here we have 40 likes. I would love to see us get to at least 100 likes before I have to pass the baton in October. So if you're watching this today and you're interested in young adult news, and young adult news especially in, in Nebraska, please do click that. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Right. Um, anybody have any questions? Um, we still have plenty of time here. Um, you can use the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Type in anything you want to say, anything you want to share, or any questions that you have um, for Rochelle. Um, we do have one here. Okay. As long as it says, I am looking forward to passive activities with my tweens. We really do not have teens who come here other than to check Facebook. Quickly, I have had sit-down together activities like making a rain stick, a mancala, or playing Rocky Bingo. I need to think our summer program out to be able to transition these to be passive. Um, oh, and then he says, duh, I never even thought of Pinterest. <laughs> <It's> basically <laughs> just comment saying looking forward to using those, yeah. Oh, and someone wants to know how, how do you find the Facebook, the art page. Um, actually, I found if you, you go to Facebook.com, you have to search for NLA Yart as the um, name of the NLA space, Y-A-R-T. Um, and I think if you just oh, go well, directly to facebook.com mm -hmm. forward slash NLA Yart, yeah. without but any spaces, you'll get Yeah, that. it's not coming up nicely in, in oh. a search either. Yeah, I did that way too. I typed it in. Um, it'll also be included in the show notes after this. We'll have the link to it. But it's facebook.com forward slash, as she said, NLA Y-A-R-T will bring you directly to their page. You know, I hope that, that um, if we have any viewers who are in libraries where they are one, one person working in that library or maybe there's only a, a couple staff people, that if you are providing a, a children's program now and you feel like you have your, your footing with that um, and you aren't yet programming in the summer for teens or even year-round, you could use these any time, um, just try one this summer, you know, whether it's the reading log or... Um, 
the one of the crafts and you know, just try one and see how it goes mm -hmm. of course Sm start small experiment see what works um, what worked for you in your library in Columbus may not work in another one it all depends on who your teens and tweens are and what they're interested in um, and some of the ones that maybe you had mentioned some that were not such a success maybe somewhere else um, in the country they their kids do love it <laughs> that, that's possible yeah. um, but yeah, I don't know if I'm willing to share if we did for those. <laughs> no, that, yeah, just saying, you know, think outside the box, you never know. Um, right. Would you have just a few comments? Some great ideas. Thanks for sharing. And someone does just say, I am a one-person library and have gotten some great ideas. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and that's something that's great about this, too, the passive part of it, is that you, you do, as you said in the video, you've got to do put in a lot of um, work to um, create the idea, the program, what they're going to do. But then after that part's done, it's kind of pretty hands-off which is nice for your um, staff time, that once you get it out there, then they're on their own and, and there's not a lot of, necessarily, a lot of need for um, staff interaction constantly. Right, and then but you can just reuse this again and again. Mm -hmm. Yep, but they're still doing cool things with the library. Absolutely. Yeah. So any other last minute questions? No, I hadn't seen any come in. Type them into the questions section and we'll grab them. Doesn't look like anything's coming in yet. Okay, well then I think we'll wrap it up. We're almost at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, contact me about being on with this presentation. It was uh, very cool. Lots of cool, fun ideas that I hope a lot of libraries will definitely use. Um, I hope so too. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, um, uh, thank you is coming through on the question section. <laughs> Thanks for a great oh, presentation. <laughs> um, and so the show has been recorded. Um, as I said, that is our... Uh, usual thing so um, the recording will be available later today I'm going to take back control here now there we go get these out of the way so lots of thanks 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 so much um, the great ideas for a small library once again yep we have a lot of those here in Nebraska <laughs> yeah. um, so yes the show has been recorded will be available later today um, so that will wrap it up for this morning's show. I uh, hope you'll join us next week, though, and Compass Live is a weekly show where it is our monthly tech talk. Uh, Michael Sowers is the technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and once a month, normally the last Wednesday of the month, he does a tech talk, so more techie-centric um, type um, discussion going on there, and uh, another librarian Brian Pitchman went to um, CES, the Consumer Electronics Show that's in Las Vegas, and he's going to come on and talk about that, um, what he did there, things related to libraries coming out of there. So I hope you'll join us next week. Um, sign up for that Tech Talk with Michael and Brian. Um, also, Encompass Live is also on Facebook. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash Encompass Live is our URL. So if you are a big Facebook user, please do uh, like us there. You'll get notifications of when new shows are coming up, uh, when our recordings are available, um, I see here I always announce join us right now you can jump in on the fly to any of our shows that we're doing live so um, definitely like us on Facebook if you want to so other than that we are wrapped up for this morning thank you very much for attending and we will see you next time on Encompass Live bye bye <laughs>